Well, I think people come to those workshops um, to be part of the process, you know, because you, you and I view the theater from, a, from this viewpoint. We look out. We see the light and we see the bums in the seats yeah. sometimes. They look at <laughs> this. They look at the pictures that we make, you know. Right. So I think for civilians to be invited into the process, they take that seriously if they have the opportunity, some of them. And they know ultimately they'll see it on stage with puppets and all of the strings and funny voices and stuff. So I, I can only think that they show up, you know. But I was going to tell you, with Billy Twinkle, I, I did a, a, it was a benefit for a festival in Calgary. And I, I said, I'll come and do a reading of Billy Twinkle. And it was an early draft. And 300 people showed up. And I think they paid 25 bucks to wow. come to this reading. And I did it. And there were three curtain calls. It was a reading. Three curtain calls. And I, I'm not making this up. I walked off stage with the hard copy of that draft and threw it in the garbage can off stage left. And I went, that's not it. And then sat in my hotel room in Calgary that night, you know, sitting in the bathroom with the door closed, smoking, because it was a non-smoking room, on the bathroom floor all night thinking, man, what have I got myself into? Because that script sucks. That's not what I intended. But it was only by reading it in public that I went, oh, no, 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 this isn't what I meant. So you totally rewrote it? The next day, I was driving down the Trans-Canada Highway to go visit my parents in Medicine Hat, and I had to pull over because I had my aha moment, which was I had written a lot of monologue in Billy Twinkle, and it was just... Right. <laughs> <laughs> and it just wasn't coming off the page. People seemed to like it that night, but I didn't like it. And then I realized, I thought of this hand puppet character, Billy's dead mentor, Sid Diamond, Right. appearing to him as a hand puppet. That's right. And the image of Sid physically bullying Billy and pushing him to the ground and dragging him by the hair up the staircase and slapping him and choking him made me laugh so hard I had to pull over on the side of the Trans-Canada Highway. But suddenly what happened is it became dialogue and it became physical and it was propelled by these two characters. Um, and that's when the show became the show it was. I just needed to, I saved myself a lot of time by getting rid of that first draft that I was already thinking was the show. So that was a really valuable thing, wow. was to stand in front of, you know, writers work in isolation. Yep. Um, and puppet builder writers w live in total isolation. So it's good to throw yourself out there during the process and say, Here's what I'm thinking, does this work? I mean, because we did a, a workshop of Billy Twinkle, of, of the script that ultimately was the script, with John Alcorn and Iris Turcott and I in a church hall that we rented for a week, so we would have a neutral ground. And they didn't laugh once. I thought I'd written something really funny, and they were just dour all week and nitpicking. That was the monologue version or the dialogue version? The dialogue version, but they didn't laugh once. And I thought I wrote some pretty snappy stuff. And that week ended with a public reading on a Friday night. And the place went upside down. And people were laughing and clapping. And, you know, I was like, why didn't you guys laugh all week? And they said, our job is not to sit here and laugh at you, Ronnie. I said, yeah, but you didn't give me any indication that it was funny. So had I not done that public reading, I would have thought, man, this isn't funny at all. Right, right. 